reconvened meeting of the Coordinating Committee. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the workings of the Council, um, one of the functions of this committee is to re-examine decisions that have been taken by the Council's executive um, when it's been formally challenged by a number of elected members. And having done that, make comments and recommendations, and the process is called a call-in. Um, and the decision that's been called in tonight, um, and which we're going to look at, relates to uh, a recommendation report on a review of leisure services, charging and leisure facilities, which went to Cabinet on the 7th of July. And the particular area of concern for the signatories of the call-in is uh, related to changes in the concession scheme currently available to past and present members of the regular and territorial armed forces. Um, at this point, I think it might be helpful if everybody around this part of the table were to identify themselves. And I'm Councillor Moira McLaughlin, and I'm Chair of the Coordinating Committee.
indicate with my pen that you've got a minute left. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jen, and thank you for the entire committee for the time this evening. I know this is an increasingly busy committee, so I do appreciate the time you are affording this very important issue this evening. Uh, so obviously I'm asking you to scrutinise the decision of the Cabinet more closely, and that being the decision which was made on the 7th of July. I think the decision uh, is specifically referred to at page 12 of your report, Pat Chair, um, that outlines the reasons behind the recommendation to make changes to the concessions to veterans throughout Wirral. Uh, Chair, paragraph 13 contains just eight, sorry, three even, contains just 18 lines and it's roughly half a page long. I respectfully submit that these 18 lines lack any detail or depth of analysis in order to justify such a very important decision that the Cabinet member and indeed the entire Cabinet sought to make that evening. Chair, I'm sure I don't need to clarify this for members um, or indeed you know, for the public. This decision is of unique importance, I believe, for the Council. The way in which we honour our military covenant and the way in which this Council shows its appreciation on behalf of those whom we represent to those who sacrifice so much is, of course, of paramount importance. It's why, for example, just coming in to the lobby this evening, I saw that the military covenant is actually reprinted and framed just on one of the rooms of the lobby here in the town hall. And it's why we all look as the local members to observe and to officiate uh, celebrations and remembrance days such as Armed Forces Day and of course um, Armistice Day as well. Chair, the debt we owe to those who serve and who have served is unquantifiable and stands incapable of satisfaction. Yet what we offered as a council in terms of this free pass was just a, a simple token of our appreciation and a real practical and tangible way in which our eternal gratitude could, could be showed and expressed to those veterans. Yet, Chair, in those 18 lines which I have previously referred to, this token offered once in a spirit of sincere goodwill is now strangled in regulation, bureaucracy and restriction. I've attempted to uncover exactly why this decision was made. On the face of the report, there is no clear rationale and none was forthcoming in the five minutes it took Cabinet to debate the matter when it came before the cabinet in July. The decision also came following a meeting of the Families and Wellbeing Performance and Policy Committee, a meeting I know you chair, uh, chair, which was held last December, during which the strategic director, in response to questioning by me, and I can quote verbatim, thanks to our good friend John Brace, who I think is behind me, she said, certainly the armed forces is something the council has been very clear on, and then she says something inaudible, followed by, we want to make sure that this is carried forward. So how then, Chair, has this clarity of thought previously presented by the Strategic Director now been replaced with confusion and restriction? The Committee should know that I've met with the Strategic Director together with other officers and the answers are still yet, yet somewhat confused. Apparently there were anticipated abuses which, propose, which the proposed scheme now before us sought to eradicate. Then much later on, I was given what I feel is the primary motivator behind this decision, that there is a potential estimate, and a stressed estimate saving to the council of £50,000 per annum. This figure was not available to me at the meeting I had with officers, but was later explained <coughs> to me, and it was explained as an analysis of potential gains. Well, Chair, members, I think that's clear as much. What analysis, what gains, and why wasn't in the original Cabinet report? Hopefully this committee will look to get more detailed answers to the questions I pose for the strategic uh, director later on this evening. Chair, my reasons for calling express other um, doubts in relation to the in relation. Yes, of course, I will only say that one minute. Um, the, the reasons I give for the calling are fairly self-evident and are published in the report, specifically in terms of how those with a psychological injury. Um, the psychological injuries, I'm sure many of you will understand by their very nature, mean that most who, or some indeed, who suffer from them are not disposed to disclosing the fact that they suffer from that illness. How is the uh, council going to administer that? Why should we force veterans to disclose that they are injured in a certain way? Surely we should offer the benefit universally as we have done previously. Finally, Chair, as regards to consultation, I was told that this was raised at a, a forum of the Wirral Armed Forces Forum, and it's 
January meeting. I was given the minutes of that January meeting and have them here this evening. However, the, the, the issue itself is not even recorded in those minutes. I think that speaks for itself. Uh, so those are my reasons, Chair. Um, I have two witnesses, unfortunately, the, the other two weren't able to attend that, I don't know if you're aware of that. I've got Eddie Denmark, who was a veteran of the Falklands conflict and also served in Northern Ireland, and also I've got Kev Hannigan from Rock Ferry, who was a former serving member of the Royal Air Force. Thank you. 
Cheshire West didn't provide anything for us to have this personnel. All for the TA reservists. In Sefton, you pay £21 a month, and it is not available to West Service personnel. And as chair of the Leisure Transformation Board, which meets monthly, I've been kept fully informed of the work which has been undertaken, and I have informed my colleagues accordingly. So, to conclude, Chair, given the very difficult financial times we are in, it is even more important that we ensure that our concessions which we provide are targeted to those who are the most vulnerable, that we have a scheme which is fair and equitable, and that with those who can pay, do pay. This scheme does just that. Thank you. session about three years ago. Unfortunately, due to ill health, I haven't been able to use it for the last couple of years and I'm undergoing treatment at the moment. Um, the thing that, just listening to the, the lady before me, she, she come up with a whole host of reasons of why they should withdraw this, but surely at the beginning, um, all these things should have been looked at. That's the thing that gets me. Um, in essence, it seems to me that World Council has reneged on a promise to veterans to give a free leisure pass and replaced it with a chaotic system that includes and excludes veterans depending on numerous factors. The most ridiculous is offering serving soldiers free passes. Serving soldiers have access to some of the most advanced training facilities and equipment in the country. And one of the other things that struck me was you could have a guy who's joined the army and been in for five days and gets seriously injured. Whilst they accept that as serious and will have a major impact on his life, if he's only served for five days, he's then allowed to have a free pass. You could get a guy who served like a friend of mine did for 42 years and he can't. It seems very imbalanced and the problems the previous lady talked about, I'm sure they can be addressed and sorted out. But well, I'm asking you now not to renege on this promise. You give this free pass to veterans and to withdraw it goes against all the principles of the military covenant. You gave us it for free, please don't withdraw it. Yeah, hello everyone, I'm, I'm Kev Hannigan. Um, I served 12 years, I've just got something to put to some notes. I served 12 years in the Royal Air Force uh, in frontline operations in Bosnia, Kosovo, Kuwait, and Air Ops Iraq um, as part of a tactical communications wing based at Bryce Norton. All of these detachments were extremely arduous in testing um, and at times extremely dangerous, notably in Kuwait and particularly Kosovo. Um, Chair, can I just continue all the way through? Yeah. Um, as long as you don't take more than five minutes. Okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll rattle through, yeah. Um, as I say, the detachments were extremely arduous in testing and at times extremely dangerous. Um, and in particular, um, an incident in Kosovo. Um, and as we in the military like to say, uh, pull up a sandbag and I'll tell you a little story. It was around the beginning of 1998 and we were based at a forward position in Skopje, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, awaiting orders to move north and peaceably remove the Yugoslav army and take control of those areas of Kosovo. 
The former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and Skopje in particular is mainly Slavic and very sympathetic to their fellow Slavs and Serbs. We were based in a shoe factory. Well, it was actually half of a shoe factory with the other half still in full operational in full operation, employing hundreds from the local population. A multinational NATO force squeezed up, sorry, of all shapes and sizes squeezed into a derelict warehouse with only mesh fencing, fencing separating us from the hostiles. Only days before I had arrived, a bear mob had attacked, uh, a bear mob of, of local hostiles uh, had attacked the base with weapons, threatening the, the NATO personnel inside. Only intervention from the Scotty police about it could have been a very, very nasty, uh, nasty and international situation. Tensions were running extremely high. Um, a few weeks into the detachment, we were all buried down, six big lads, all squeezed into a not so big tent. It was around 4 a.m., all of a sudden, we all woke simultaneously, all to hear what I can only describe as one almighty crash. A noise so loud that it actually became inaudible to my hearing range. It just kept on getting louder. What followed was a few minutes of all hell breaking loose, an organised chaos of headless chickens running around, bumping, falling into each other. Um, as the army charged to their post and took guard in true laconic area of style, one of my colleagues just sat to be sleeping back and went, off, went back to bed, went back to sleep, saying that he'd only get up if they dared to try it again. We all made it to our section and I was detailed to go and find out what was happening. I wandered down to the police point to see a rather grey and gaunt looking military policeman standing outside his post, sucking on a cigarette like it was his last. I asked him what, what happened and if he was okay, um, and he told us that it was one of those RAF TCW Land Rovers that had been blown up, only metres from the police post, and that he had been on the desk when it went off. So even around half an hour later, he was still trembling and shaking. He pointed me to his sergeant, who took me to, to view the wreckage, and there was our Land Rover. Where, there, where our Land Rover had been was a still smouldering carcass of a wagon, um, and with, with the damage to vehicles around. In the debrief, we found out the reason why we'd all woken up that night was down to the shock wave hitting us. The amount of explosives used varied between three and five pounds of semtex. The perpetrators were an organisation called the Macedonian Dawn. But what really struck with me that night <laughs> was that our Land Rover had only been parked up 35 minutes previously uh, by one of my colleagues on the night shift. It was a close shave. But it impressed on me that this was real grown up stuff now. This wasn't Dad's Army, this was real hurty stuff, as we call it. So, anyway, just, I just wanted to just give a little, little example of.